to this very special edition of the Pondi Lit Fest. Uh, we are with Professor Vijay Sate, formerly with the Deccan College Post-Graduation and Research Institute, um, who has specialized in the study of animals in archaeology, a field called archaeozoology. <coughs> uh, we are actually sitting here at Rakigari, uh, even as the latest rounds of excavations are going on right at the back here. So, uh, welcome, Professor, and thank you very much thank for so giving much. us this interview. Uh, first of all, explain to us what is archaeozoology. Archaeozoology basically deals with remains of animals which have been excavated from the sites, archaeological sites, and uh, uh, these bones are principally an outcome of interaction of man with animals. And also the, and the, the bones of animals which have been in the vicinity and that is how they have uh, their bones as the time passes by, the bones and the human cultures as we see them in this context of Rakhiri also that they are all buried together. Mm. So the bones, especially the animal bones from archaeological context are studied as part of archaeozoology. So, uh, with regard to animals, since fauna is your main principal area of interest, could you please trace us, uh, trace for us the relationship man from the prehistoric times has had with animals and how that has changed in the course of time as and when man progressed from hunter-gatherer to uh, herders and uh, farmers to the current times and what has the relationship been with, uh, with the animals? Well, if you look at the history of association or associational history of animals with man, we stretch it back to the stage when he was a scavenger. Mm. He was single-handedly uh, killing animals, not killing, but procuring meat. Mm. So he had to be a scavenger because uh, he wouldn't have been able to uh, with, with bare minimum toolkit that he, he could have had. So a uh, journey from scavenger to hunter, predator to domesticator is a long journey. Yeah. And it all starts with initially as uh, uh, they begin moving in groups. I am just giving a, uh, a very yeah. rough background because then if you if try to uh, ex explain it, it will go into multiple uh, time slots. But yes, I would say that yes, uh, they s realizing this potential of animal, potential in terms of danger, potential in terms of uh, uh, meat and uh, the possibility of having a better food potential of having uh, longer association in terms of having seen them, realizing they move in herds, their movements and in that process they can ensure their uh, uh, source of protein you can call it, source mm -hmm. of food they can call it as long as they are moving along with animals. Not only that but basically hunting and hunting predates uh, domestication as we know mm. th for that. So in domestication we have a, a very subtle observations emerging out of human, long human association with animals. So if you look at this history of animal man animal relationship, the history starts with scavenging, then hunting and when he is hunter gatherer, he is experimenting domestication. Mm. And then finally, he is bringing the animal into complete control. And that's why when we say of the definition of domestication, domestication is, is the process in which even the breeding is brought under control. Okay. So that's very important uh, mm. part of it. So if you see this entire uh, list of animals which have been finally domesticated now, all seem to have, you know, man has a control over it, what kind of uh, you know, breeding done under his observations, under his control, determines, you know, experimentation that has gone beyond in, in years to come later on in, in, in t uh, even up till med medieval times. Okay. So uh, when it comes to uh, the animals, uh, let if we go back again to the, uh, to the, um, to the early times, um, it is true that uh, the uh, man's relationship with animals was extremely intimate from the point of view of the, the man hunting the animal or then also the animal presenting itself as a danger to man and also how that reflected in the earliest art forms of uh, Oh, that's a very interesting topic mm -hmm. because when you look at uh, uh, the fear factor yes. of predators around you, mm -hmm. 
at the same time there are potential uh, meat uh, bearing animals around you you would like to kill them eat but you also have uh, predators around you so there is a non stop uh, fear in the mind of those prehistoric people non stop they crave because they know that what whatever they have killed today might not survive might, might not l uh, last longer mm -hmm. so once that all gets over they have to uh, embark on another uh, journey of hunting animals yes. so in that non stop interaction whether they are moving around along the uh, river banks se uh, securing uh, raw, raw material for stone making stone tools or they are collecting botanical uh, remains or data from plants and things like that they are also constantly thinking about what next where they find imagine how a, a tiger has to fetch food for himself it's not like a cow who gets the which gets this uh, fodder right there in front of them so that difference makes a uh, man a sort of you know very wise uh, that has made him wise from the beginning mm -hmm. that he has to survive so survive survival is a is, is a basic issue for those uh, ancient people and that has become a kind of that has superimposed in in the form of fabulous uh, rock paintings across the country if you look at why india you go across the world you go to africa you go to different parts of europe and australia and so on you have a beautiful man animal relationship i would call it this way because you have hunting scenes you have domesticating your animal going around with a cart or sometimes animals are being hunted sometimes some animals are specifically drawn uh, which look looks as if they have been uh, defied uh, status that they have been given to so this sequence tells us about a human uh, fascination you can call it take the liberty of calling it a fascination so the deification of the animal is is as old as as uh, man's interaction with animal itself must have been yes okay. must have been if example i can bring here is of bhimbetka hmm. bhimbetka they had there is a, a massive huge uh, wild boar hmm. with certain addition of which is not natural okay and the 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 kind of attention has been paid to in terms of its uh, depiction uh, such as that yes it's not something usual that they have drawn mm. there is certain idea behind this so deification that i said about possibly could have been there as and far as such paintings are concerned and across paintings this we see <coughs> wherever such prehistoric paintings are there are certain yeah. places but not everywhere you come across such mm -hmm. but yes it's a common element in all places there you mentioned a few times uh, moving where the animals move so when we as indians we think of animals and we think of migration we think of man induced an animal migration but uh, from listening to what you say you also say that animals at a particular stage it is the movement of the animals that induced man to move so could you please uh, that i would not consider as a massive long uh, range migration okay at this point of time but i would simply say that in search of food in hmm. tracing and uh, chasing animals they certainly might go beyond their their so called territory because we are not very sure about what could have been the territory of prehistoric man to certain areas so this this making it easy walk over the places mm. must have been triggered by wherever there is a source of energy available and they could just kill and eat so then we move uh, we uh, sort of move the subject to the domestication and the various aspects that you need to touch when we talk of domestication first of all these are wild animals that some of which were chosen to be domesticated so what is the impact on the animal uh, what are the uh, changes that they need to uh, you know even in the fact that they don't even move as much if they are stall fed as opposed to grazing if there are uh, you know these changes that have to happen and then what are the benefits of uh, herding as a, as a as an activity and um, to what extent if you can show us the completely uh, symbiotic relationship man has had over civilizations and over time with 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 his animals with his domesticated animals domestication hasn't been a overnight process mm. it's been long one even much before domestication or much before the idea of why not to have them for longer time mm. came into the mind of prehistoric people it was just a constant observation that probably while chasing those herds they must have noticed the little calves around mm. which, which are not able to move with that speed mm. as as of their uh, uh, parents i would say so this quite likely that they must have been uh, capturing those little ones okay. and then experimenting which we call experimenting and just trying to keep them with them keep with them so for longer time as they grow possibly 
their uh, their progeny is coming into picture and realizing that yes it's not just a question of uh, one week a food store here is perhaps a three months or six months or one year food store this does not mean that they are going just going to survive on those available animals at, in their backyard yeah. but they are there these these animals are supplementing other things which they are collecting from forests yeah. so this kind of a complementary food and also important uh, protein part of their diet mm -hmm. was all being taken care of slowly and slowly as we go into this in a later stage of domestication but domestication i must say domestication has been one of the most strenuous process and uh, it's quite likely that it hasn't come out of uh, uh, universal choice okay it's quite okay. possible that uh, uh, the growing population demographic uh, uh, structure was changing mm -hmm. so the demography dictated induced uh, depletion of natural resources and that also implies that they are losing on uh, the fauna in the, uh, in the in the natural context mm. and then finally that must have driven them into the thought of why not to have them longer and imagine uh, to hunt and get meat home is much easier than keeping an animal till it reaches reaches the stage of producing another one and feeding them taking care of their health disease and so on and so forth so definitely it came with a very heavy price okay. there must there must have been a lot of experimentations there must have been a lot of failed experiments mm -hmm. and it, this entire exercise has really been a really been a very tough exercise and maybe a uh, journey from primary source primary products mm. to secondary products was a major achievement that was uh, i would call it like the yes because primary products are like meat. wool meat okay. uh, you can call it to some extent milk which is of course not so easy for a for any prehistoric man to draw milk from a wild animal mm -hmm. but still you can call it that yes it must have been possible to some extent but at the hide meat yes. uh, bones and bones for making tools of different objects okay. and uh, that's all and hide of course you know very well that uh, as we see the drawings in the books yes. and known fact it's a common sense prevails that hide must have been used for uh, as part of clothes mm -hmm. clothing so this entire exercise was very easy but from primary products to secondary products when we say when we go we are talking about perennial source of energy mm. so we are talking about kind of a uh, perennial perenniality if i'm allowed to use, say yes. like that or i can say that it's a uh, continuous source of meat and various other products which would not have been possible to draw from animals had they been in wild state correct and then you have division not every animal has been domesticated by man mm -hmm. why hasn't man attempted at all even once to domesticate bear mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. he has certainly opted for a bull uh, i mean to say the bovines the buffaloes yes. then you look at uh, elephants but of course elephants are not completely domesticated elephants are still considered as partial domesticated okay because their uh, breeding is not beyond the control of man mm -hmm. but okay. if you look at uh, uh, cattle buffalo sheep goat camel you have a stratification in terms of their uh, util uh, utility value the cattle the donkey horse they're all for drudgery and transport but uh, uh, if you look at cattle buffalo you can look at sheep goat mm. look at dogs they have a very certain purpose behind yes in fact that was going to be my transitional question so if you look at this yeah. uh, i'm sorry no, no, but exactly. if you look at this uh, dogs domestication mm. that's the first animal to be domesticated okay. a journey from wolf to dog is very very fascinating today we have just there have been uh, empty number of sites in 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 russia in central you? asia in uh, yes yes partly uh, central asia then you come to southern europe you come to kashmir in india that you have these uh, evidence of dog being reported and uh, very very recent research tells us that probably dog must have been domesticated as early as in 18000 years ago okay so that's the first one to get domesticated mm -hmm. followed by other animals such as cattle buffalo horse camel of course much later mm. much much later and chicken to just 2000 years ago so if you look at the list of animals and the year the calendar which calendar years how many years ago this particular animal was uh, uh, domesticated we find that uh, uh, none of them have been domesticated one place okay all have a different different places mm -hmm. 
chicken you have uh, in South Asia, uh, you have in India the domestication centers for uh, zebu cattle. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a uh, horse, uh, this very well known two sites of Botai and uh, Drevika in Kazakhstan and Ukraine are the well known sites which, which, are, which are reported the evidence of uh, domestication of horses. Donkeys, of course, we go to this uh, northern Asia, northern Africa. Mm. We, uh, as far as the dog is concerned, we have southern Europe. But then again, uh, there are many more uh, sites emerging, and possibly different different places there could have been a concomitant exercise of domesticating animals. Mm -hmm. So this is a very interesting picture. So if you look at this, uh, they could have been domesticated there first, and then uh, their movement must have been in different parts of the country or the world and how these domesticated animals must have been moving around because as far as Indian record is concerned, uh, the evidence of wild cattle is not at all seen in Indus Valley. Okay. We have all domesticated, mm -hmm. which is called zebu. Yes. Zebu cattle is all domesticated from a uh, domesticated form that we have in India. If you look at uh, wild cattle, primigenous that you have uh, uh, from uh, West Asia, West Asia, you have uh, from, from sites from Iran, Iraq and beyond, you have West, uh, wild cattle also besides the domestic one. But in India and in domestic and uh, in Indus Valley, you have none of these sites which have yielded any confirmed evidence of wild cattle. So, but uh, we know for sure that uh, domestication centers have been in the northeast India and also in the Zob Valley, Quetta and in, uh, Indus subcontinent. So we had this various uh, centers where the, the uh, animals were domesticated initially, and then as the movement took place along with the along with their masters, mm. you find them spreading all across the world. So there are two distinct, uh, you know, uh, uses. One is uh, obviously consumption. The other one also will reflect on, say, directly reflecting on uh, advanced agricultural practices, like for instance the use of the plow, or the, you know, using cattle to to, to do the tilling. So that is also, the, so is that, does your field also cover, uh, it would probably sh shed light on the farming me mechanisms of... Well, when I say it's at the start of it, archaeozoology, hmm. archaeozoology entails a very long uh, exercise. You know, it has a very, very uh, in-depth exercise of, first of all, what bones we, come, uh, we get from our excavations, we have to identify them. And while identifying them, we, uh, uh, we, we begin with uh, uh, identifying the skeletal orientation, skeletal part, then mm. animal, genus, species, mm. to that uh, that level, approximate identification. And then we look at, uh, has, it, has it come from any uh, sick animal? When we say mm. sick, the sickness should be reflected in the bones, because we have no mm. such uh, physiological ex ex expressions in bones, unless and until that, mm. that is a bone disease, bone disorder. So when you talked about draft animals, or uh, pulling carts, and mm. things like that, impact of such heavy duty activities for a very long period of time do leave significant marks on their uh, bones yes. in certain parts of the body. Okay. So that is also that that also tells us about that yes these for example bifid spine bifid spine is a thoracic spine in the hump mm -hmm. where the, the, the uh, neural spine of uh, thoracic vertebra has a bifid shape. And this bifid shape is considered as very one of the confirmed evidence of domestications as far as cattle are concerned. And then again, that is happening so at that, that point is an of time. evolution because of the use of the I would not call it evolution. I would call it uh, uh, work-related okay. uh, adaptations or work-related uh, manifestations of yeah. different types of work that, that has gone into the history of uh, life history of an animal when it was domesticated, when it's worked. Because these animals are there as long as they are living. Yes. And if you look at the uh, demography of uh, um, animal world, especially from mm -hmm. excavations, how we try to reconstruct, we have initially uh, one uh, exercise that is NISP, minimum number of, uh, sorry, the, and, and, uh, the number of identified specimens. Okay. So if we have one bone, uh, which has been broken into five, six parts, because once the animals had died, they could have been exposed for longer duration and started splitting because of subaerial exposure, okay. excessive heat. Now you look at this, if suppose we throw some skeletons here and wait for them to dry and see what happens to these bones, you'll find over the years, they'll start splintering and disappearing. But mm. probably before uh, disappear, dis disappearing, they got buried in the sediments here. Mm. 
they got buried in the uh, uh, they were uh, they were in drawn into uh, cultural deposits mm -hmm. because they have been part and parcel of that deposit mm -hmm. that period so when you see them they are uh, broken so quite likely that one single animal one single bone may be having six seven pieces which actually belong to them but now they are all six seven species pieces so how do we identify the bones we cannot have exaggerated number of individuals mm. because from this number of identified specimens we calculate number of individuals minimum number of individuals which are based upon the calculation and some statistics based on the number of bones of per individual from left and right and mm. uh, which side left side how many right side how many because we have to decide the side of a bone whether mm -hmm. this bone has come from left side of the body or the right side of the body so this calculation tells us about a number of individuals and then we look at the aging and sexing that what is the age uh, pr profile of these uh, uh, these these many animals we find the younger ones cattle and buffalo we have much much younger ones so we start finding a bias in the uh, representation okay. we look at this as a as a as a uh, manipulated assemblage because they have been killing the young uh, males uh -huh. and they keeping the uh, females Yes. for uh, longer cycles that's something that happens to this exactly age, exactly yeah. and then uh, select males are drawn into uh, yes. bullock carts and yeah. all the drafting uh, exactly. purposes and that's how and once they become uh, useless from the viewpoint of their services to their uh, masters mm. they are sent to slaughter houses yes. what happens today also correct yes it's the same thing and then we see we see the male population uh, uh, so the cattle much older in age whose bones are represented as food debris because bones are also having cut marks okay. bones are also having charring marks mm. so they are charred they are roasted they are cooked they are yes. fired so and then you have uh, significant cut marks along the meat bearing parts now there is also a science of process of uh, uh, carcass processing Uh -huh. there is a subtle uh, yes. method of carcass process carcass carcass processing so you don't see randomly cut mm -hmm. and for that reason we have been visiting slaughter houses number of times we visit slaughter houses and we just observe how the butcher is cutting mm -hmm. and then we we would certainly they have implements but yes. prehistoric uh, the archaeological population didn't have such fine tools yes. to dismember the body of a dead animal so then uh, what parts are cut what parts parts are uh, displayed for sale what are thrown away and then what happens to these thrown uh, discarded portions what do they do with the snew what do they do with the uh, with the larder what what do they do with uh, hide mm. the entire exercise of what's happening today in the market is not taken uh, i would say verbatim for uh, interpretations for the ancient cultures but, but we can make use of this uh, this uh, this uh, bits and pieces and use this to jot, dot the uh, join the uh, dots which are there in the archaeological record so as a scientist are you at all conflicted by the uh, dual uh, practice of uh, the worship of animal as well as the consumption of animal the, the, you know that is uh, that becomes very controversial in the general discourse but uh, how is your approach to this uh, thing do you, do you are you conflicted by it or as a scientist you just have to accept what you, what evidence speaks you have to interpret. we have to accept the fact that animals have been killed and eaten yes regardless of their uh, their uh, status in uh, s uh, s uh, their hierarchical status in their socio religious fabric of the any civilization they have been eaten and uh, even concurrently like you are defying the the animal as well as the consumption is 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 parallel or it is like there is a question of taboo here yeah I know so that's why I'm asking. So there's a question of taboo here. So as far as taboo is concerned, uh -huh. we respect that. So okay. uh, we had to we had to keep in mind that when we are dealing with this uh, particular uh, civilization, yes. And uh, I would not call it a religious civilization, but I would call it a civilization not believing in certain practices. Okay. So and it's perfectly normal for a certain practice to evolve over time. I mean, there should Absolutely, not be yes. a conflict yes, in yes, accepting yes, the yes, fact yes. that over time certain practices were you know abandoned or certain choices were made uh, you know that that that's fine from a perspective of the scientist right and uh, there is a rational behind uh, uh, beef uh, as a taboo for because we know for sure that the economic value of cattle and the cattle population that we have in india mm -hmm. and contribution of cattle large bovines to human indian civilization is 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 uh, enormous mm -hmm. so we just cannot deny that right. so possibly this looks very likely that 
uh, why kill when we can make use of it okay. and it's a natural process it's very natural process and thereafter of course we have religious uh, tax to it hmm. so i think that's a, a evolutionary process in our yes. in our uh, in fact it's beautiful isn't it that we have, have we have we, have, we don't have to uh, look at the past as uh, set and that we have to accept that you know even our veneration and our consumption and our food habits evolve over time as as do our objects of veneration which is uh, yes. which i am not conflicted by it but i don't know if uh, i don't uh, see any much of uh, difficulty in saying so <laughs> <laughs> yeah first of your courageous man um so uh moving on to um, the next uh, point about uh, about uh, the animals i also forgot to yeah. point uh, uh, point out one important aspect of uh, having examined the bones for their importance in food economy of uh, ancient civilization mm -hmm. animal bones also have a tremendous importance in reconstructing paleo ecology okay because we have not just domestic animals in our mm -hmm. because uh, um, animals are being killed from uh, the jungles mm -hmm. so you have deer you have uh, antelope we have gazella we have small uh, portable animals we have heavy animals like uh, many a time we have buffaloes killed in the in the in the forests and they been brought in so when we think of wild animals deer if you look at deer it's not simply easy to bring a deer home Uh, look at the weight of sambar and uh, swag, uh, swamp deer mm. uh, even the spotted deer so so then they must have been very very choosy about which part of the body should be brought home mm. and then what do we do with the bones mm. so if you look at uh, uh, the assemblage of bones from archaeological sites we have three categories one is a bone assemblage which clearly shows that these bones are emerging out of uh, <coughs> uh, kind of food debris <coughs> and one assemblage is entirely uh bone tools okay <coughs> they have made use of these bones for manufacturing different types of tools and this bone this could be also antlers because antlers are very easily accessible in forests but mm. so they are shed annually by the deer species so they are brought in here so they make use of bones for making tools they make use of uh, antlers to make the different kind of tools and uh, then <coughs> ivory and bones are also been made into different objects and these objects could be of adornment like uh, bone beads or fish bone beads yes. or kind of objects to be kept in the house regardless of what uh, uh, what belief system they could have had at that point of time mm -hmm. but at least uh, using these bones for different purposes mm -hmm. we call it uh, importance of animals beyond calories okay. that you are use them you are eating the bone uh, eating the meat now what are you doing with the bones mm. is for this particular purpose so um and then the uh, wild part of the assemblage i mean i'm to say the bones of animals entirely wild species we had to study them to find out uh, what could have been the ecological landscape what how how the ecological landscape could have been when indus valley i would say or maybe mm. chakrutik cultures whatever this uh, civilization is identified with mm. must have been benefited by these uh, res natural resources around the uh, in the vicinity of the site because we certainly know that the uh, uh, rakhigadi person people living in rakhigadi wouldn't go as far as delhi to fetch mm. meat they would go in the vicinity of hardly 10 15 right. kilometers because they had to bring the food home so then they would cut them into pieces mm. so in in as far as the wild animals are concerned we have very uh, very selected parts found uh, selected bones found in assemblages we don't find the entire skeleton very rarely we find uh, ske skeleton which is complete so that shows that the uh, uh, the choice is made at the yes. time of hunting okay and then yes. you would bring out bring home only that is uh, potential in or you can call it meat bearing which can be used for yes. that purpose so um uh, man domesticates animals uh, for various reasons and then man also has to coexist with nature so there has been um, a record of man also maintaining the flora and fauna around it that man does necessarily a gross so the forested areas or so what is what is it that you can come to know by studying the bones of animals of as to man's relationship with nature and the animals within that space and not you know like the like the wild animals uh, do do we come to know from their practices that they realize that they need their space and that sustainable forest 
ecosystems was essential even for the uh, domesticated civilizations to coexist. I think that would be a little difficult to talk about. <laughs> Okay. Difficult to talk about because uh, we we cannot really understand how that at the at the base of bones, of course, we can say that yes, they have killed these many animals which mm. are from wild. They have killed these many animals from the uh, domestic stock, livestock. Mm. But uh, this was done with the purpose of, as you mentioned about, uh -huh. is a bit dicey about. It's difficult to, difficult to say. That's fine. I mean, it's, it's good. So now let's come to the you know the question that everybody wants. I don't want to focus on it specifically. But uh, you know, but when we talk about we are in Rafigari, we are in a Harappan civilizational setup, and obviously the question uppermost of when I am talking to a archaeozoologist is, uh, did they come riding on horsebacks? And do we have horses? <laughs> you know, what do we know of horses in India? Were they horses? Were they donkeys? Can you throw a, a oh, broad very, spectrum very, light on Very, very contested issue yes, that you are, I, I you are dragging <laughs> me into. Well, but I'll just give you yes. some brief uh, uh, profile of the whole issue. Yes. Uh, the story goes with uh, uh, some horse-like bones having been discovered in different parts, different uh, Harappan sites in the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. I do not call it uh, from Pakistan or India, but I would call it Indian subcontinent because, of course, it's all one when we look at it in terms of geographical expanse. Uh, way years back, we had. Uh, terracotta figurine of a horse from Mojitaro. Mm -hmm. Then we had also um, terracotta figurines from different excavations such as Kalibanga, also from Lothal, Pirano Gundai also they have. There are bones though limited, yes, which have been assigned to as equus. Mm -hmm. Then could this be a horse? because uh, identification of animals is the first stage of any analysis of fauna from archaeological sites. So having identified this as equus, second question came up to as uh, is it a horse or a donkey or a wild ass? Mm. Because Harappan civilization is certainly is, is located in the area which is very close to Rana of Kutch where we have uh, Asiatic wild ass mm. which is called equus, uh, equus hemionus, uh, equus uh, hemionus kur. Uh, the the names scientific names for uh, wild ass. So the question is that was it a horse? Mm. And when we look at uh, Wheeler's theory of iron invasion, mm. we look at that uh, how scattered, how uh, desperate uh, the people must have been running away, and they have been trampled by the invading Aryans, mm -hmm. and their skeletons are found all over in the lane. That's a famous uh, uh, statement yes. and the picture supporting that kind of an evidence right. has emerged in uh, textbooks and publications for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a very, very uh, debatable issue whether really horse was uh, f uh, living in India or a horse was found in India only because harpans came on their back to mm -hmm. India. So this has certainly uh, been a very, very, very controversial issue and there have been two uh, schools of thought here. Mm -hmm. uh, one believes in yes, horses have, certainly must have been there, and another says sorry, there have been no horses. Mm -hmm. We all we got the horses with Aryans, mm -hmm. so automatically there is a there is a divide in all this. Uh, what mm -hmm. what has been well discussed all over the, on the all platforms mm -hmm. so far. So then archaeology comes to the forefront. Archaeology can only decide whether we really can call this a horse or a donkey or a wild ass. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, uh, there are bones of uh, equus. At this point of time, all, I also would like to call it equus, not horse, mm -hmm. because equus is a general term, generic term, uh, cabalus uh, or uh, wild ass or uh, asinus. It comes only after we have identified them perfectly. So equus having been reported from Surukotada, from Kalibanga, from Kuntasi, if you look at the table, understand. So geographically, what is the scattering? Okay, yeah, we don't have a map here. Yes. Uh, we have okay. from uh, Mojidaro, mm -hmm. we have from Harappa, we have from uh, um, uh, Chanudaro, we have from, they're all from uh, now yeah, in Pakistan, yes. then Kalibanga, Ganganagar district of Rajasthan, yes. then we have Lothal, which is in Gujarat, Gujarat. Kuntasi in, in, in Rajkot district is Saurashtra, Gujarat, then you have from Malwan, and again in Gujarat. Then you have from a uh, 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 couple of more, in fact, from uh, Binjor, that site is very close to Ganganagar, in this Ganganagar in Rajasthan. 
So we have a cross section of nearly 20 sites which have reported horse, reported mm. sorry, reported equi equid remains. Can we call all of these remains as belong having belonged to horses? Basically, as far as they are in flesh and blood, we can see yes, it's a donkey and it's a, it's a horse. Mm. But when we have them, we have find them in bones and that mm. too, uh, scattered, fragmentary state of preservation then discrimination becomes very, very difficult, very dicey. And a, any, any wrong interpretation can lead to multiple uh, erroneous hypotheses about it. Yeah, and then blown up narrative. Exactly, exactly. So we have to be very, very careful about it. Yes. So then what else, What how we can do it? We got a kind of, you know, uh, sort of a boost. Of various, we got it f after 1991, 92, 93 uh, researches by two important scholars, one Sondar Bokuni from uh, Budapest mm -hmm. and uh, he was he was invited to study the bones from Surkotara. And uh, he looked at these bones and he said yes, out of those number of bones which include premolars, it includes uh, limb bones, which includes uh, phalanges and all, they, some of them uh, definitely deserve to be known as to be called as of horses true horses okay. and his study dr bokani is one of the world's renowned very highly respected uh, equine uh, equus specialist archaeologist and uh, his word is the last word when it comes to uh, european archaeology mm -hmm. so we can say what he has said is not just because he is respected but his interpretations were very very interesting mm -hmm. he gave a morphometric analysis he gave uh, qualita qualitative uh, observations about the bones, discrimination between horse and uh, wild ass and domestic horse and uh, domestic ass. Soon after uh, Bakani had finished his analysis, uh, we definitely wanted to see how another uh, school has to say anything about it. So we have another very highly respected uh, archaeologist from America, from medicine, uh, Dr. Richard Meadow. So he was also invited. He also looked at the specimens, and he said, "No, no, no, no. None of them are of. Uh, it will be too. It will be them. It's just a matter of notion that you like to call them as horse." But so uh, he very categorically said that none of these bones deserve to be, or they can ever be called as of, uh, or even uh, some of them, or any of them, to be called as those of horse, domestic horse, because the size is such large. Okay. They come much closer to wild ass. Now, if you look at a uh, wild ass, domestic, uh, domestic uh, donkey, and uh, uh, domestic horse, wild ass stands out prominently. Okay. It's a wild species. It's a very, very, uh, very prominent. Uh, the morphology is, mm -hmm. and the dimensions in the morphometry certainly stands out separately as so far as these two concerned. How do the arguments concerned. compare? As, uh, as, a, as a third scientist, looking yes, at the these, arguments. Yes, this third scientist says that uh, they are all of. Uh, likelihood of being of uh, bishetic wild ass. Okay. Size is uh, distinctive mm -hmm. and uh, uh, some of them may have been of uh, horse, mm -hmm. may have been of horse, but that's a matter of notion. Okay. So he, they are simply giving, giving them, they are not giving them any option, they are simply saying that you, that's your notion that they are horse, mm -hmm. but archaeologically they cannot be considered of horse. So this, and sadly we lost uh, Dr. Bokoni within months after he had visited India. Okay. He died in 1994. So he could not give us final report. Mm -hmm. But interpretations, analysis that he had submitted and that has been published some uh, 25 years ago. And that has come as a, a kind of a uh, landmark yardstick for figuring out, deciding about whether this is horse or a donkey. Now, uh, their interpretation on one, on one hand. On the other hand, when we look at this now emerging data about horses and donkeys, it definitely looks like that some of them are of horses, okay. but the problem, that the is basic, your yes, yes, there are, mm -hmm. there, are, there is a likelihood of finding some horses among all that. Mm -hmm. I strongly feel, but then I just feel, and I don't make a very, uh, very uh, emphatic, uh, uh, assertive statement because, because uh, uh, diagnostic features available in horses and donkeys are very few, mm -hmm. and the absence of those diagnostic features. In the and besides the bones being very fragmentary in nature, except whatever we have discovered from Surkotara is very, very interesting. 
otherwise none of these other places have such complete preservation of horse or equus mm. bones so we are forced to resort to this status of uh, indeterminate mm. a horse or donkey or but possibly the ultimate analysis of uh, of the validity of our civilization um the horse is gains importance because someone stated that they came on horseback so our owners of i think we have philo enough philological evidence we have that. enough philological evidence we have enough uh, sanskrit records to support can you i'm sure you must be knowing about that 100 times the, there is a reference to aswa ashwa, ashwa yes, yes then there are references to number of uh, ribs the, uh, the domestic horse has are the 17 or 18 that they have given there then there also a reference to uh, um, the no they may not be making uh, mention of horse hmm. but the animal that has been referred to as hmm. yes so there is uh, and I, i don't think we can deny that evidence okay. that is there in text hmm. ancient text okay. so i think that would be a little i would say uh, it will be too much on our part to deny the existence yes. of horse in india exactly. it will be it will be injustice to the presence of horse in india <laughs> that's a wonderful way of putting it actually <laughs> yeah that's true i mean uh, yeah i mean i think the gaze of the scientist and the weighted knowledge of what uh, your domain says is far more important than what we want to hear and uh, you know and make conjectures of whichever side of the of the of the spectrum you may you may be on because Uh, it's it's more important that uh, your weighted opinion uh, now in fact our in knowledge. fact i would like to tell you that now uh, when this we come to the dead end now mm. how do we go about yes then genetic evidence comes as a very important one okay so now the time has come that we need the, uh, the genetic uh, examination of uh, uh, horses so that is what you're doing now you're uh, doing mix fields and uh, i'm not doing right now okay. but we are just uh, thinking that it should be done okay and uh, it has to be interdisciplinary mm -hmm. it has to be with the uh, microscopic study of uh, bones and teeth genetic dna and at the same time morphometry i think uh, all has the multi prong approach only can resolve the issue otherwise uh, we will continue fighting because i can clearly see for last 110 years we have this uh, conundrum going around and how long we enjoy this flamoxing state mm -hmm. we have to have an answer that's true i think it will it will amount to as if you know keep it burning so that uh, the subject keeps on <laughs> i guess you understand what i yes, mean that you keep it keeps it burning so that yes. the subject has yes. more of buyers as far as the controversy is concerned now why keep that yes. state that's true resolution has to be made now it's enough okay and so um, now that you there to last uh, one point and then we can conclude with uh, your notion of what do we do with uh, with the, with the heritage this this uh, this uh, fossil and bone heritage that we have and what are your ideas and what are your concerns as to we as a people and government should do but before that also a little bit on the primary objects you work with that is fossils and bones by nature they tend to decompose or degenerate so can you um, for the layman throw the light on the difficulties you that you encounter you told us about fragmentation and first of, of the, all yeah, first of all i must tell you that we deal with bare minimum okay not even bare <laughs> we are we are de dealing with uh, there is a very interesting uh, quote in fact one of the very well known paleontological books uh, are titled with this kind of thing uh, incompleteness and inadequacy of fossil record okay so mm -hmm. you're dealing with the broken ones correct you're dealing with incomplete uh, bones you're dealing with um, very often in inadequate information coming from mm -hmm. then how do we uh, reconstruct the reconstruction is a huge challenge for that matter even in archaeologists has the same problem mm. anybody dealing with the fragmented data the yours is organic material uh, yes 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 so we have bones hmm. teeth now if i had to say faunal evidence faunal history then i take the liberty of stretching deep in time hmm. to the fossil record hmm. and if i don't go that deep into the uh, patal of dinosaurian <laughs> era then i would st start at quaternary where human evolution has been concomitant and how man and animal has been uh, sharing the same landscape for for last 2 million years 
that particular period is a very revolutionary period, revolutionary mm -hmm. period because in that period we have in india uh, thousands of foss fossiliferous localities spread across length and breadth of india mm -hmm. whether it's ganges or its tributaries whether it's namada its tributaries or whether it's godavari and its tributaries whether it's krishna because i'm just naming those principal rivers mm -hmm. and their tributaries and then their tributaries so it's a it's a uh, very uh, dendritic drainage pattern mm -hmm. that is uh, that is nothing but a uh, natural archive of fossil record mm -hmm. all these are the places where in the sedimentary deposits all these animals uh, which have lived and perished in the area their bones have been deposited and preserved mm -hmm. there is a likelihood of many of these bones having been exposed um, owing to floods uh, reburied again got transported reburied and many of those places are where there is a final burial mm -hmm. and after final burial i call it that they never had any chance or an opportunity of further transportation mm -hmm. so we have a uh, complete incomplete adequate inadequate mm -hmm. all shades of yes. completeness that we come across in archaeological fossil record but this is happening in paleontology i must uh, we must we have to draw a line between paleontology and archaeo archaeozoology because mm -hmm. uh, here in paleontology also in a prehistoric context prehistoric man is 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 not uh, sedentary is not he is not adopted to sedentism no. he doesn't have houses or huts or whatever you call it he doesn't have domestic animals so he is depending upon these so he is one of the hunters he is one of those uh, um, you know threats to animal world correct and then uh, so he is not a central position he is not a modify a modifying agent for the animals so he is not uh, what there is a very interesting uh, phrase about it appropriation of nature so mm -hmm. he is not appropriating animals mm -hmm. he is just killing them and forget about it mm -hmm. but uh, he is one of the agents for death of animals but as soon as we enter into the world of uh, archaeozoology we have man as a principal modifier he decides which has to live which has to die which has to go into the uh, bullock cart or a, a cart or which has to go into the plowing the land and what to do with these bones and hide and all that so he is the final authority in, yes. in deciding the life and death and post death situations of animals so that that is also reflected in fossil record archaeological record so one thing comes to mind because I, my father is a farmer and we had gone to interior maharashtra in a village called pimpri and he's a dairy farmer and you know the the sizes of the cattle were really small and stunted and he said this is a product of inbreeding and they were domesticated animals but you know and uh, so i want to know because you talked about reproductive cycles being controlled by as the first sign of domesticity uh, do you have evidence of any sort of knowledge they had so that this i can tell you that they have deplete. this when it comes to and it comes to the uh, the aspect of their knowledge hmm. it's reflected in rock art okay Re recently we have uh, f completed one project and uh, uh, my student had done a f uh, marvelous uh, research on this we looked into this uh, uh, various depictions of cattle from rock art of madhya pradesh from north india from and andhra pradesh from karnataka from uh, tamil nadu and we find that there is a subtle change mm. and there is a subtle representation which becomes prominent for certain shapes in okay. certain times now when it comes to dating the rock art it's always a difficult issue very very difficult mm -hmm. issue because uh, the dating of the rock art has been entirely so far based on um, style stylistic uh, representation then the kind of uh, superimposition mm -hmm. and then number and context in which association they are being reported they are being painted and all, all that but still i would say that uh, uh, the types of breeds mm -hmm. the uh, the prominent dewlip prominent hump or the different shapes of uh, uh, different shapes that uh, the the horn cores have or the length and width the height of the animal the, the shape of the tail we had taken several uh, parameters to decide whether this is the same cattle which has been represented in north india okay. so we find that yes there is a clear evidence of different breeds okay. being painted mm -hmm. so it's not that the man is painting decidedly that yes i know what this breed is so i'm painting what he has seen in the in the in real world he's he's mm -hmm. documenting with the honestly with full honesty mm -hmm. so what we can see is that whether this is fossil record or this is a archaeological record or a soft format record you can we can call it as a painted fossil record of rock mm -hmm. art all are definitely honest depiction and honest record of what has really happened in past
it's the onus is on us that we keep it as honest as possible okay. by uh, proper identification and rational to be used for so that not to mix up with any kind of you know uh, erroneous interpretations for reconstruction of uh, habitat reconstruction of paleoecology reconstruction of food economy reconstruction mm. of subsistence st studies mm. because there has been a lot of exchange of uh, one very interesting story i, uh, I, sh I must make a mention of uh, deccan chalkolithic site of inamgaon very close to pune mm. there they found out that in the settlement half of the uh, bull's uh, body was shared you know the animal meat was shared by two different families okay so they found they found half of the right hand side right half of the bones of right half bull were found in one house mm -hmm. another was another house so when they started piecing together data they found that yes this is left of the same individual because the measurements match mm -hmm. measurements the age of the individual the horn shape then the length and breadth and width of all these animals uh, the bones all con and then the from which stratum they are found mm -hmm. temporal uh, yes. uh, this uh, uniformity yeah, huh. all was confirming to that the animal has been shared mm -hmm. so that's this also becomes very interesting part yeah. that how when it comes to sharing then there is also a question of how societies are developing correct also meat is perishable so it's hmm. better shared yes because you can't store yes 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 possibly it must have been shared for some ritualistic purposes mm. or maybe some reason behind the sharing so this way you can also understand the human mind the process mm -hmm. and in fact there is a very independent strong branch of archaeology today and that is known as social archaeology and social archaeology is just like social anthropology it reminds me of that only mm -hmm. because uh, social archaeology deals with uh, uh, animal taboo then uh, totem animals mm -hmm. then uh, animals being used as you know sort of you know uh, animal bones and animals certain animals their bones are used for certain purposes then which have a religious uh, tag to it and then how animals and man when it comes to subsistence not just food economy hmm. they relate to one another in the course of time so this social archaeology today is a very vibrant branch hmm. being examined in, in different parts of uh, Europe and America. Yes, sir. and um, animal being integral to man ever since he learned to actually settle. I think it, it, you, you cannot diminish its role and its influence uh, in in the way we have grown. Yes, the best example would be Lord Ganesha. Okay. We have an elephant, which is venerated, of course. That's true. But then we have this uh, evidence in Sanctum Sanctorium, mm -hmm. which is perhaps the most beloved god of rest That's the true. whole country. Indeed. So this journey of an animal from a uh, forest to sanctum sanctorium, mm -hmm. journey of different animals to different segments of uh, social hierarchy, where they are associated with, yes, and mythology of animals, mm -hmm. and then how its manifestation is also found in uh, stones, animals in stone. I mean to say, uh, depiction of animals in various temple architecture across country, mm -hmm. across the world, can, uh, across mm -hmm. India. If you look at uh, uh, Gupta period, or if you look at uh, Mauryan, post Mauryan, if you, you can go to later periods of where the sixth century, eighth century, ninth century, uh, common era, the kind of temple architecture we have, and the way the animals have been drawn. In fact, when we look at these animals, we also use them as a as a indirect evidence of their presence in this area. Hmm. Because if they have been chiseled out in the temples, that means that uh, the sculptor and the people around. Who, would, who decided that these animals had to be there on the uh, on the temple, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, ex exteriors of the temple, were aware that this animal was present in the area. Yeah, like the so this of the crocodile always has fascinated me as well as the snake, because in in terms of temple uh, animal representation, the yes. crocodile is is omnipresent yes. as well yes. as the snake. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. the animals are depicted out of fear, mm -hmm. or out of veneration, probably because fear, mm -hmm. or maybe because of the the utility that that has. Like when we, it can becomes a taboo, or uh, kind of you know, uh, mythology of animals today is the most important topic mm -hmm. in uh, in social archaeology. Okay. So that's why fossils and myth has emerged as a very strong topic of research, mm -hmm. folklores, oral traditions, mm -hmm. with regard to fossils and the mythical uh, beasts emerging into the process. It's all related to uh, human psyche, how they observe, how they. So oral 
traditions is something that uh, that uh, that the level of archaeology you take seriously because that is that is a sign of continuity. Well, I would say oral traditions come as a complementary record. Mm -hmm. well, nothing can be rubbish so easily. Okay, if it has survived. Yes, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, the oral traditions or the folklore are nothing mm -hmm. but fossilized thoughts. Correct. Something has happened in the past, uh -huh. and the, like onion peels, you have layers after layers of you know. Uh, somebody says that yes, I have seen a snake. That uh -huh. third person, you know, he, you know, he has seen ten snakes in there, mm -hmm. but s there has been a snake. Correct. Is a fact. Yes. Number we don't know. Yes. So that way, you know, the uh, the pie, when the you peel them off, mm. you go to the actual uh, uh, inner core of this fact. So it can be an actual genuine trigger point for genuine yes, finding. yes, yes. Folklore can never be rubbished. Yes. They are very yes. strong record of, uh, uh, and the only thing is that we have to see the continuity of this record. Exactly. In the like for example a rock art mm -hmm. in in Australia we have rock art happening today also it's a modern mm -hmm. rock art mm -hmm. there's a continuous tradition okay. but when we go to uh, sites in India they say it's we don't we have no idea who has drawn them but certainly our ancestors but we really don't feel like uh, uh, connecting or relating ourselves with this this kind of a tradition we don't know what they have done who has done this okay. so that could be the fact. Because mm -hmm. because they, they they have no such continuation of tradition, but at least rock art tells us about the uh, primeval symbolism. Correct. How the symbols began, how the evolution of symbols, and how symbols are, and as you know well that symbols uh, are so important today yes, in every sphere of humanity. Correct. So uh, to conclude, um, your view on um, on um, on this entire body of of actually treasure trove that exists. And what as we as a peop people should do to get us, I mean, trigger interest, uh, the entire thought process ecosystem should sort of uh, galvanize itself around the preservation, interest generation. What are your views on how this, this branch of... I would say, I would say it happens at different levels, Import, most important on two levels. One is the, the, uh, the um, administrative levels when they plan how to conserve a site. This is fossil site or a Harappan site like Rakhigadi mm. or any other heritage site that our temple architecture they are preserving. But that's all in the in the domain of administration and then the planning and then the money comes from them all that. But another part is very very equally important is that educating common man mm -hmm. which is lacking here. I wouldn't say that the common man is not educated but I would say majority of them are not aware of it. Mm -hmm. The value and sense value of this. Okay. Uh, now, you would call them as uh, uh, terra, in, terra incognita. I don't know what is happening there mm -hmm. because I'm in my world. I'm mm -hmm. not connected with that. It's it's Gade Murde Vukharna. It's an ancient thing. Why should I relate myself to that? If that kind of a uh, uh, sort of you know um, alien uh, uh, thought prevails in their mind, uh, we have no future for this for this uh, heritage size. No matter how much you conserve, preserve. So that awareness will generate, uh, awareness will create a situation where people will also like to preserve their own uh, this, uh, heritage. This heritage is of uh, India's, but first and foremost is of the people of Rakhigadi. Correct. They should be proud of their uh, their own heritage. Correct. And they can be if they know how to conserve it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, when it comes to fossil sites, uh, if I look at uh, fossil uh, parks, Geological Survey of India has uh, has about three dozens of uh, fossil parks across the length and breadth. We have some examples I can give you of Sarguja in Chhattisgarh, one, uh, uh, <coughs> this another very important fossil park in Saketi near Chandigarh or uh, some more fossil parks in, in, in fact in Puducherry there is one uh, very well known fossil park, plant uh, fossil wood fossil park. Very close to the farm. Yes. yes. <laughs> then there is another fossil park in Rajasthan, the number of fossil parks and uh, they have become center of to geotourism. So they initiated good system of having the enough information yes. brochures and uh, important information displayed all over. But what happens to the local population? Yes. If you you pilferage the fossil record for the sake of a few penny, then what will happen to the fossil record which is there, going to be there for um, ages mm -hmm. to come? They have to feel a sense of pride and ownership and belonging. Exactly. That exactly. Right? And when you see that pride, I think then the future is secured, as far as sites are concerned. And it's of course, uh, it's, it's one is one feels happy to see that all the uh, the archaeological monuments, such uh, excavated sites, mm. 
our uh, fossil parks are under uh, under watch of government of india mm. but it also needs to be supported by local people yes. and that's why it's 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 uh, what i call it as a desideratum that we have a uh, um, public lectures popular yes. talks correct uh, village to village we can have we can conduct and you go to school meet a sarpanch go to a primary school conduct a, a general class for the entire school and you will find that next time when you visit the next time when an archaeologist visits you'll find that a lot of people have because they need to be told that you have a heritage but don't bring it to your homes correct don't uh, pluck it from there just let us know where it is and we'll do the uh, proper uh, documentation yes. because once this taken out of context it loses its all value true just for example if i had taken out a, a bone of a particular animal from the context where it is supposed to be the context decides period its time its yes. social context everything is depending upon that so not to be uh, not to be um, rooted out of that but inform us where it has been found so that's that, an excellent point actually that communication context. between the villagers the local mm -hmm. people and the excavators the communication between the local people who in whose uh, jurisdiction this uh, site happened to fall and the people who are the managing authorities for the conservation of the site excavators right. conservators government of india or government of that particular state and the local people to the village level not mm. just taluka and district level village level mm. and we in fact this is the need of the r that every district should have a museum every yes. district should have a museum mm. highlighting the important uh, heritage of that particular yes. district that's true if russia can have every next uh, small town of russia can have museum and they can be proud of their museum and heritage mm. what's wrong with us why can't we be yes. I think there's an urgent need to to valorize this and make absolutely, us understand absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just question of something which is very old, so important, and we have that uh, in, infatuation for the old things, and we like to mm. keep them in our uh, living rooms, so or we like mm. to have them sporting them on a on a as a bead uh, f uh, bone bead necklace we're wearing it. No, not at all. You don't have to be fascinated for the wrong reasons. Mm. Yes. Like you said, context is everything, and preservation of the site is everything, and we have to valorize the object in the site, yes. so we know what we correct, were correct, and correct, from correct. where we come from. Yes. Yes. So I hope this session, sir, will go a long way in generating that interest and generating that awakening. Thank you so much for your time. My and, pleasure. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that yes. Watching you work in this uh, situation is a dream come true. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much.